And the only ones that win in our system now are the judges and the lawyers. And, you know, that's pretty much it. Those who, and those who have enough money to pay them. And uh, that's, just, that's just the way it is. It's not about justice. And one thing to think about before I let you go, because I'm going to end this pretty quick, is if the court, and this is, this is why, why I've done a lot of what I've done. If the, if the court is just and the law is just, meaning if the law is just and the court is upholding that, then what does anybody need an attorney for? Like, if, the, if justice is going to be administered in the court, and if the law is just, then what does anybody need an attorney for? You only need an attorney if justice is not going to happen in the court, and if the law is not just. Because then he's got to try to somehow manipulate and maneuver and, you know, go back and forth to try to find some type of relief for you. But if justice was really uh, a mainstay of the court, if it's really what was happening there, and if the law was really just, we wouldn't need lawyers. So I'll think on that for a little while. Thank you for your time. I just thought I'd give you this update. And, uh, God bless you, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. To quote the great American philosopher. Peace on earth. This Christmas season finds us a rather bewildered human race. We neither have peace within nor peace without. Everywhere, paralyzing fears harrow people by day and haunt them by night. And our world is sick with war. Everywhere we turn, we see its ominous possibilities. And yet, my friends, a Christmas hope for peace and goodwill toward all men can no longer be dismissed as a kind of pious dream of some utopian hoper. If we don't have goodwill toward men in this world, we will destroy ourselves by the misuse of our own instruments in our own power. Yes, sir. Wisdom born of experience should tell us that war is obsolete. There may have been a time when war served as a negative good by preventing the spread and growth of an evil force but the very destructive power of modern weapons of warfare eliminates even the possibility that war may any longer serve as a negative good. And so if we assume that life is worth living, if we assume that mankind has a right to survive, then we must find an alternative to war. And so let us this morning explore the conditions for peace. And as we explore these conditions, I would like to suggest that modern man really go all out to study the meaning of Nonviolence, its philosophy and its strategy. We have experimented with the meaning of nonviolence in our struggle for racial justice in the United States. But now the time has come for man to 
experiment with nonviolence in all areas of human conflict. And that means nonviolence on an international scale. Now let me suggest first that if we are to have peace on earth, our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. No individual can live alone. No nation can live alone. And as long as we try, the more we're going to have war in this world. The judgment of God is upon us. Yes, sir. And we must either learn to live together as brothers, or we are all going to perish together as fools. Yes, as nations and individuals, we are interdependent. I've mentioned to you before of our visit to India some years ago. It was a marvelous experience. But I say to you this morning that there were those depressing moments. For how can one avoid being depressed when he sees with his own eyes evidences of millions of people going to bed hungry at night? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How can one avoid being depressed when he sees with his own eyes thousands of people sleeping on the sidewalks at night? More than a million people sleep on the sidewalks of Bombay, India every night. More than a half a million sleep on the sidewalks of Calcutta every night. They have no houses to go in. They have no beds to sleep in. As I beheld these conditions, something within me cried out, can we in America stand idly by and not be concerned? And an answer came, oh no. And I started thinking about the fact Right here in our country, we spend millions of dollars every day to store surplus food. Make it plain, make it plain. And I said to myself, I know where we can store that food free of charge. In the wrinkled stomachs of the millions of God's children in Asia and Africa, Latin America, and even in our own nation who go to bed hungry at night. It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny, and whatever affects one directly yes, sir. affects all indirectly. We are made to live together because of the interrelated structure of reality. And did you ever stop to think that you can't leave for your job in the morning without being dependent on most of the world? You get up in the morning and go to the bathroom and reach over for a sponge, and that's handed to you by a Pacific Islander. You reach for the bar of soap, and that's given to you at the hands of a Frenchman. And then you go in the kitchen to drink your coffee for the morning. And that's poured in your cup by a South American. Or maybe you want tea. That's poured in your cup by a Chinese. Or maybe you are desirous of having cocoa for breakfast, and that's poured in your cup by a West African. And then you reach over for your toast, and that's given to you at the hands of an English-speaking farmer, not to mention the baker. And before you finish eating breakfast in the morning, you are dependent on more than half of the world. Yes. This is the way our universe is structured. It is its interrelated quality. We aren't going to have peace on earth until we recognize this basic fact 
of the interrelated structure of all reality. Now let me say, secondly, that if we are to have peace in the world, men and nations must embrace the nonviolent affirmation that ends and means must cohere. One of the great philosophical debates of history has been over the whole question of means and ends. And there have always been those who argued that the end justifies the means, that the means really aren't important. The important thing is to get to the end you seek. So if you are seeking to develop a just society, the important thing is to get that, and the means uh, really aren't important. Any means that will get you there. They may, may be violent. They may be untruthful means. They may even be unjust means to get to a just end. There have been those who have argued this throughout history. But we will never have peace in the world until men everywhere recognize that ends are not cut off from means because the means represent the ideal in the making and the end in process. And ultimately, you can't reach good ends through evil means because the means represent the seed and the end represents the tree. It's one of the strangest things that all of the great military geniuses of the world have talked about peace. The conquerors of old who came killing in pursuit of peace. Alexander, Julius Caesar, Charlemagne, and Napoleon were akin in seeking a peaceful world order. And do you know if you will read Mein Kampf close enough, Hitler contended that everything that he did in Germany was for peace. And the leaders of the world today talk eloquently about peace. Every time we drop our bombs in North Vietnam, President Johnson is talking eloquently about peace. Make it plain. Make it plain. What is the problem? They are talking about peace as a distant goal, as an end we seek. But one day we must come to see that peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but it is a means by which we arrive at that goal. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. All of this is saying that in the final analysis, means and ends must cohere because the end is pre-existent in the means, and ultimately destructive means cannot bring about constructive ends. Now let me say that the next thing we must be concerned about if we are to have peace on earth, goodwill toward men, must be the nonviolent affirmation of the sacredness of all human life. Life is sacred. Every man is somebody because he is a child of God. Yes. And so when we say, Thou shalt not kill, we are really saying that Human life is too sacred yes. to be killed on the battlefields of the world. 
Man is more than a tiny vagary of whirling electrons or a whisp of smoke from a limitless smoldering. Man is a child of God made in his image. Yes. And therefore must be respected as such. Until men see this everywhere, until nations see this everywhere, we will be fighting wars. But one day somebody should remind us that even though there may be political and ideological differences, the Vietnamese are our brothers. Yes, yes. The Russians are our brothers. The yes. Chinese yes. are our brothers. And one day, one day, we've got to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. But in Christ, that is neither Jew nor Gentile. In Christ, that is neither male nor female. In Christ, that is neither communist nor capitalist in Christ somehow that is neither bond nor free we are all one in Christ Jesus and when we truly believe in the sacredness of human personality we won't exploit people right. we won't trample over people with our own feet of oppression we won't kill anybody there are three words for love in the Greek New Testament. One is the word eros, and eros is a sort of aesthetic, romantic love. Plato used to talk about it a great deal in his dialogues, the yearning of the soul for the realm of the divine. And there is and can always be something beautiful about eros, even in its expressions of romance. Some of the most beautiful love in all of the world has been expressed this way. And then the Greek language talks about phileo, which is another word for love. Now, phileo is a kind of intimate love between personal friends. This is the kind of love that you have for those people that you get along with well and those that you like on this level, you love because you are loved. You love those people that appeal to you and those that you like. But then the Greek language comes out with another word for love. It is a word agape. Agape. Agape is more than romantic love. It is more than friendship. Agape is understanding creative, redemptive, Goodwill for all men. Agape is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. Theologians would say that it is the love of God operating in the human heart. Yes. And so when you rise to love on this level, you love all men not because you like them, not because their ways appeal to you, but you love every man because God loves him. That's it. That's and this is what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies. And I'm happy that he didn't say like your enemies because there are some people that I find it pretty difficult to like. Like is an affectionate emotion and I can't like anybody bombing my home. I can't like anybody who would exploit me. I can't like anybody who would trample over me with injustices. I can't like them. I can't like anybody who threatens to kill me day in and day out. But Jesus reminds us that love is greater than like. Yes, sir. Love is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all men. And I think this is where we are as a people in our struggle for racial justice. We can't ever give up. We must work passionately and unrelentingly for first-class citizenship. We must never let up in our determination to remove every vestige of segregation and discrimination from our nation. 
but we shall not in the process relinquish our privilege to love. I've seen too much hate to want to hate myself. I've seen hate on the faces of too many sheriffs, too many white citizens, counselors, and too many clansmen of the South to want to hate myself. And every time I see it, I say to myself, hate is too great a burden to bear. Yes. And somehow, we must be able to stand up before our most bitter opponents and say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. We will meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will and we will still love you. We cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws and abide by the unjust system because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good and so throw us in jail. And we will still love you, bomb our homes and threaten our children and as difficult as it is, we will still love you. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our communities at the midnight hour and drag us out on some wayside road and leave us half dead as you beat us and we will still love you. Send your propaganda agents around the country and make it appear that we are not fit culturally and otherwise for integration, but we'll still love you. But be ye assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. And one day we will win our freedom. We will not only win freedom for ourselves. Yes. We will so appeal to your heart and conscience that we will win you in the process. And our victory yes. will be a double victory. And if that is to be peace on earth and goodwill toward men, we must finally believe in the ultimate morality of the universe and believe that all reality hinges on moral foundations. Something must remind us of this as we somehow stand in the Christmas season and think of the Easter season simultaneously, for the two somehow go together. Christ came to show us the way. Men love darkness rather than the light, and they crucified him. And there on Good Friday on the cross, it was still dark. But then Easter came, and Easter is an eternal reminder of the fact that truth crushed to earth will rise again. Easter justifies Carlisle in saying, no lie can live forever. And so this is our faith. And as we continue to hope for peace on earth and goodwill toward men, let us know that in the process, we have cosmic companionship. Yes. In 1963, on a sweltering August afternoon, we stood in Washington, D.C. We talked to the nation about many things. And toward the end of that afternoon, I tried to talk to the nation about a dream that I'd had. And I must confess to you today that not long after talking about that dream, I started seeing it turn into a nightmare. I remember the first time I saw that dream turned into a nightmare, just a few weeks after I had talked about it. It was when four beautiful, unoffending, innocent Negro girls were murdered in a church in Birmingham, Alabama. I watched that dream turn into a nightmare as I moved through the ghettos of the nation. 
and saw my black brothers and sisters perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity and saw the nation really doing nothing to grapple with the Negro's problem of poverty. I saw that dream turn into a nightmare as I watched my black, black brothers and sisters in the midst of anger and understandable outrage, in the midst of their hurt, in the midst of their disappointment, turn to misguided riots to try to solve that problem. I saw that dream turn to a nightmare as I watched the war in Vietnam escalate. Yes, sir. And as I saw so-called military advisors, 16,000 strong, turn into fighting soldiers and so today some 500,000 American boys are fighting on Asian soil. Yes, I am personally the victim of deferred dreams, of blasted hopes. But in spite of that, I close today yes, sir. by saying I still have a dream. Because you know you can't give up in life. If you lose hope somehow, you lose that vitality that keeps life moving. You lose that courage to be that quality that helps you to go on in spite of. And so today I still have a dream. Men will rise up and come to see that they are made to live together as brothers. I still have a dream this morning that one day every Negro in this country, every colored person in the world will be judged on the basis of the content of his character rather than the color of his skin. And every man will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. I still have a dream today that one day the idle industries of Appalachia will be revitalized. And empty stomachs of Mississippi will be filled and brotherhood will be more than a few words at the end of a prayer, but the first order of business on every legislative agenda. I still have a dream yes, today. Yes. And one day, justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I still have a dream today that in all of our state houses and city halls, men will be elected to go there who will do justly. Yes, and love mercy and walk humbly with their God. I still have a dream today that one day war will come to an end, that men will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Yes. And nations will no longer rise up against nations, neither will they study war anymore. I still have a dream today that one day the lamb and the lion will lie down together and every man will sit under his own vine and fig tree and none shall be afraid. I still have a dream today that one day every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill will be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. I still have a dream. And with this faith, we will be able to adjourn the counsels of despair and bring new light into the dark chambers of pessimism. With this faith, we will be able to speed up the day yes. when there will be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. It will be a glorious day. The morning stars will sing together, and the sons of God will shout for joy. And help welcome our honored, distinguished guests 
the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Thank you very kindly. <laughs> Principal Fornese, Mr. Williams, members of the faculty and members of the student body of Barrett Junior High School, ladies and gentlemen. I need not pause to say how very delighted I am to be here today and to have the opportunity of taking a brief break in a pretty busy schedule in the city of Philadelphia uh, to share with you the students of Barrett Junior High School. And I want to express my personal appreciation to the principal and the administration uh, for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity uh, to see this very fine and enthusiastic group of students here at Barrett. I guess I ought to start out with a commercial, and that is uh, tonight we're going to have a great night in the city of Philadelphia at the Spectrum. Now, I know you've heard of that new impressive structure called the Spectrum. And I know you've heard of Harry Belafonte and Aretha Franklin and Nipsey Russell and Sidney Poitier and all of these other great and outstanding artists. Well, they're going to be here tonight at the Spectrum. And I hope that each of you will go home and tell your parents to be there tonight for this great Freedom Festival. And I hope you will come also, for it will be a great experience. And by coming, uh, you will be supporting uh, the work of the Civil Rights Movement. Now that I've gotten the commercial out of the way, I'll move on and uh, say some things that I want to say very briefly. And I'm being very honest, I'm going to be brief because I have other engagements. I don't have a tradition of being brief all the time. You know, I'm a Baptist preacher and we can talk a long time. But I'm going to really be brief today. I want to ask you a question and that is what is in your life's blueprint. This is the most important and crucial period of your lives for what you do now and what you decide now at this age may well determine which way your life shall go. And whenever a building is constructed, you usually have an architect who draws a blueprint. And that blueprint serves as the pattern, as the guide, as the model for those who are to build the building. And a building is not well erected without a good, sound, and solid blueprint. Now each of you is in the process of building the structure of your lives. And the question is whether you have a proper a solid and a sound blueprint. And I want to suggest 
some of the things that should be in your life's blueprint. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth, and your own somebodiness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth and always feel that your life has ultimate significance. Now that means that you should not be ashamed of your color. You know it's very unfortunate that in so many instances our society has placed a stigma on the Negro's color. And you know there are some Negroes who are ashamed of themselves. But don't be ashamed of your color. Don't be ashamed of your biological features. Somehow you must be able to say in your own lives and really believe it, I am black but beautiful. And believe it in your heart. And therefore, you need not be lured into purchasing cosmetics advertised to make you lighter. Neither do you need to process your hair to make it appear straight. I have good hair, and it's as good as anybody else's hair in the world. And we've got to believe that. Now, in your life's blueprint, be sure that you have that a principle of somebodyness. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have as a basic principle the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. You're going to be deciding as the days and the years unfold what you will do in life, what your life's work will be. And once you discover what it will be, set out to do it and to do it well. And I say to you, my young friends, that doors are opening to each of you. Doors of opportunity are opening to each of you that were not open to your mothers and to your fathers. And the great challenge facing you is to be ready to enter these doors as they open. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great essayist, said in a lecture back in 1871 that if a man can write a better book or preach a better sermon or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. That hadn't always been true, but it will become increasingly true. And so I would urge you to study hard, to burn the midnight oil. I would say to you, don't drop out of school, and I understand all of the sociological reasons why we often drop out of school. But I urge you, in spite of your economic plight, in spite of the situation that you are forced to live so often with intolerable conditions, stay in school. And when you discover what you're going to be in life, set out to do it as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. And just don't set out to do a good Negro job, but do a good job that anybody could do. 
Don't set out to be just a good Negro doctor, a good Negro lawyer, a good Negro school teacher, a good Negro preacher, a good Negro barber, a beautician, uh, a good Negro skilled laborer. For if you set out to do that, you have already flunked your matriculation exam for entrance into the university of integration. Set out to do a good job and do that job so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures, sweep streets like Beethoven composed music, sweep streets like Leontine Price sings before the Metro Metropolitan Opera, and sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the host of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. <laughs> if you can't be a pine on the top of the hill, be a scrub in the valley. But be the best little scrub on the side of the rill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. always we already have some noble examples of black men and black women who demonstrated to us that human nature cannot be cataloged they in their own lives have walked through long and desolate nights of oppression and yet they've risen up and plunged against cloud filled nights of affliction new and blazing stars of inspiration. And so from an old slave cabin of Virginia's hills, Booker T. Washington rose up to be one of America's great leaders. He lit a torch in Alabama, and darkness fled in that setting. Yes, you should know this because it's in your own city, from a poverty-stricken area of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Marin Anderson rose up to be the world's greatest contralto so that a Toscanini could say that a voice like this comes only once in a century. And so that's a diff That's for my booing case. I just got a text that I was reading and I wanted to check that, but back to the program. And the arms of a mother who can neither read nor write, Roland Hayes rose up to be one of the world's great singers and carried his melodious voice into the palaces and mansions of kings and queens from crippling circumstances. And there came a George Washington Carver to carve for himself an imperishable niche in the annals of science. There was a star in the diplomatic sky, and then came Ralph Bunce, the grandson of a slave preacher, and he reached up and grabbed it and allowed it to shine in his life with all of its scintillating beauty. There was a star in the athletic sky, and then came Jackie Robinson in his day and Willie Mays in his day with their powerful bats and their calm spirits. Then came Jesse Owens with his fleet and dashing feet. Then came Joe Lewis and Muhammad Ali with their educated fists. All of them came to tell us that we can be somebody and to justify the conviction of the poet, fleecy locks and black complexion cannot forfeit nature's claim. Skin may differ, but affection dwells in black and white the same. And if I were so tall as to reach the pole, 
or to grasp the ocean at a span, I must be measured by my soul. The mind is the standard of the man. And finally, <laughs> and finally in your last blueprint, must be a commitment to the eternal principles of beauty, love, and justice. Don't allow anybody to pull you so low as to make you hate them. Don't allow anybody to cause you to lose your self-respect to the point that you do not struggle for justice. However young you are, you have a responsibility to seek to make your nation a better nation in which to live. You have a responsibility to seek to make life better for everybody. And so you must be involved in the struggle for freedom and justice. Now in this struggle for freedom and justice there are many constructive things that we all can do and that we all must do. And we must not give ourselves to those things which will not solve our problems. You've heard the word nonviolent and you've heard the word violent. I happen to believe in nonviolence. We struggle with this method with young people and adults alike all over the South, and we have won some significant victories, and we've got to struggle with it all over the North because the problems are as serious in the North as they are in the South. But I believe as we struggle with these problems, we've got to struggle with them with a method that can be militant, but at the same time does not destroy life or property. And so our slogan must not be burn, baby, burn. It must be build, baby, build. Organize, baby, organize. <laughs> yes, our slogan must be Learn, baby, learn, so that we can earn, baby, earn. <laughs> and with a powerful commitment, I believe that we can transform dark yesterdays of injustice into bright tomorrows of justice and humanity. Let us keep going toward the goal of selfhood, toward the realization of the dream of brotherhood and toward the realization of the dream of understanding goodwill. Let nobody stop us. I close by quoting once more the man that the young lady quoted, that magnificent black bard who has now passed on, Langston Hughes. One day he wrote a poem entitled Mother to Son the mother didn't always have her grammar right, but she uttered words of great symbolic profundity. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stat. It's had tax in it, boards torn up, places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time, I's been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you stop now. Don't you set out on the steps cause you find this kind of hard. But I still going, boy. I still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Well, life for none of us has been a crystal stair. But we must keep moving. We must keep going. If you can't fly, run. 
If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl, but by all means, keep moving.